Howdy ho fellow sojourners and welcome back to another edition of Appropriating the Culture. On today's episode, we're continuing with a theme that we set up last week dealing with the use of words, how words are used in order to change minds and influence thinking. Last week, the focus was on the deliberate and intentional decision to replace the word Christmas with a more generic holiday, as seen in ads like this. Tristan! Hey, Lexus, play holiday music. Alexa, play holiday music. Okay. Does Alexa not know what Christmas is? Alexa! Alexa, play Christmas music. Sorry, I don't know that one. Well, why would you? Alexa, play holiday music. <laughs> Alexa, stop, I'm not Jewish. But I am Pastor Shane, and I'll be your linguist today as we appropriate some culture. Nearly everywhere you look in our culture, there's a battle over words. In just the past month, we've seen Merriam-Webster stealth edit the term anti-vaxxer to define it as not only a person who is opposed to the use of vaccines, but also opposed to regulations mandating vaccination, which is not the definition of an anti-vaxxer. That'd be an anti-mandator. Because, of course, being against certain mandates and regulations does not make you anti-vax. It's completely possible, in fact, it's demonstrable, that you can be personally vaccinated, completely pro-vax, and also against mandates. But the broadening of the term is to lump people who are mandate-hesitant as being equal with people who are against, you know, the polio vaccine. We saw multiple news sites report on the horrific attack in Wisconsin this way. Five dead, more than 40 hurt after SUV plows into marchers at Wisconsin holiday parade. Holiday parade, that's a twofer. But that's odd phrasing that, frankly, most news sources went with. A sentence construction that makes it sound as if the SUV were responsible, like the SUV was Stephen King's Christine. Sorry, holiday in Alexa, play holiday music. Ramadan is here. Ramadan? I think, I think that's for Ramadan. But again, you see how the use of words can manipulate the way you think about news events. Saying an SUV plows through parade marchers places the blame on an object and disassociates it from the perpetrator of the crime. In fact, the phrasing doesn't even tell you what the crime is. It says nothing about motive. It says nothing about intent. Now, to be fair, that could be a good thing to do, particularly when the news is first getting out and you may not have all the facts. Did the person driving suddenly have a stroke and unintentionally ram their vehicle into people? Or was this a deliberate act to kill and maim? But even after the details started to emerge that this was no accident, the media still framed things oddly. The Washington Post said, Here's what we know so far on the sequence of events that led to the Waukesha tragedy caused by a SUV. CNN tweeted, Waukesha will hold a moment of silence today, marking one week since a car drove through a city Christmas parade, killing six people and injuring scores of others. A car did that. That's why you always got to check the car facts to see if your motorized vehicle is a homicidal maniac. Now compare and contrast Waukesha with Charlottesville, both cases in which men intentionally rammed their vehicles into a crowd of people. Woman recalls total terror of Charlottesville car attack versus the suspect in the deadly Waukesha parade crash has been charged with five counts of first degree intentional homicide. A car crash versus a car attack. Subtle difference, but the word choices matter. They have different connotations, and so they shape the way we think about it. When people complain about bias in the media, it's not just contained to what is reported and what is not reported, but also to how it's reported. You can convey the same facts, but the word choices used can bring very different connotations. We also, of course, see the manipulation of language in the transgender field, like the fight over pronouns. I saw this image posted from a purported application. 
Hey gender, androgyny, bi gender, see you later gender, demi gender, demi more, gender fluid, break fluid, gender queer, pan gender, trans man, male, trans woman, female, two spirit, a gender not listed, decline to answer non binary, and finally cis female and cis male. Not only does the laundry list of terms convey a certain perspective on the nature of human gender, but even the traditional male and female categories are modified with cis, which is to say even selecting the appropriate category is still buying into the framework and conveying that male and female are merely another variants of gender identity. This is depressing. I need some holiday music. Alexa, play holiday music. So much time. Billy Holiday. Got it. Got it. Clever. It's very clever. Well, this is fitting, actually, because Appropriate in the Culture is brought to us today by SpyDot, your friendly bot for menial tasks through voice command. And don't worry, SpyDot does not spy on you. That's a misnomer. But it will listen to your every command, whether that's playing holiday music with a family or helping you host a dinner party for all your friends and neighbors. SpyDot even comes with a selection of helpful dinner topics, so there'll never be a dull moment. Just say, SpyDot, give me some icebreakers and watch your holiday party take off with such scintillating topics such as shopping habits, political affiliations, banking and routing info, and many others. SpyDot, we're listening to help and serve. And that's all. Alrighty, so uh, hinting at Big Brother, in George Orwell's 1984, he introduces this notion of newspeak, which is a sort of narrowing of language. So you don't have good and bad, you have good and ungood. You have plus good and double plus good. And the basic idea there is that by controlling language, you control minds. You're narrowing the scope of language to narrow the scope of thought. You can remove ideas by removing words, because the words themselves are the conduits of the idea. And there's something to that. The Bible describes Jesus as the logos, as the word. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Jesus is the Word. That's very evocative. Matthew Henry's commentary puts it this way, Our words explain our minds to others. So was the Son of God sent in order to reveal his Father's mind to the world. And then the Word takes on flesh. Jesus is the embodiment of God, conveying what it is when we say the Word God. Right? He's the embodiment of the scriptures themselves. Uh, so there's something in that and how our words contain ideas and how those ideas then impact and shape our understanding. And that's why this linguistic ruse that's playing out in all sorts of spheres in our culture is so important to recognize. You know, we did an episode on equity. You know, what does it mean and whether or not it's a biblical notion? And the thing that struck me is I have heard more pastors in the past year use the term equity than I have in the past 30. Not fairness, not equality, equity, equitable. We need to be equitable. This needs to be done equitably. Interesting word choice. And it's not wrong or unbiblical in their usage or intention of the word, uh, but the word in our culture does have another meaning, another association, which is really not biblical. Uh, words are conveyors of ideas, and bad ideas can take root in churches by falling into linguistic traps. And this is something that has been dealt with throughout all of church history, even in the formulation of the creeds, right? Begotten, not made. Very specific, highly debated language to try to capture and convey the proper theology of the Trinity. And we need to be continually alert and active and diligent about how words of our culture are manipulating and how we can use words to point people to the word. And you can drop me a word on the usual social media platforms, rate, review, like, share, subscribe, and I'll see you next week uh, for more Appropriate in the Culture.